Welcome everyone to reInvent 2022. Uh, quick show of hands. How many people, this is your first reInvent? Keep your hand up, second reInvent. Third, fourth, anybody going five years strong? Six years strong. Wow, all right. Anybody full 10 years? Okay, great, because there's like a you know, gold jacket I would have to bust out for you, but you know. Um, welcome to NFX 301, hybrid cloud, cataloging objects across storage systems. My name is Denise Mace. I'm an account manager who's had the privilege to work with Netflix for the last four years. On stage joining me shortly will be Priyesh and Kishore. They will be the experts that you guys will be uh, asking questions to at the end of this session. Um, while we go ahead and kick this off, I'd like to do a quick intro on both my co-speakers. So Priyesh works with object storage and catalog service infrastructure. He's got a background in databases and distributed systems. Kishore builds storage and transfer platform services for studio engineering teams and has a background in distributed systems and computer networking. These folks have worked diligently on innovations in the S3 and storage space. They've been able to bring brand new innovations to how we look at studio storage. As we launch into this chat, um, I encourage you guys to think about how this can help you guys innovate in your own businesses moving forward. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and bring up Kishore. Thank you, Dennis. Good morning, uh, everyone. So my name is Kishore. Um, before we jump into hybrid clouds and how we catalog data within different storage systems, I want to give you a brief um, introduction on uh, like Netflix Studio ecosystem and then how does the workflows generally look like at a very high level. And then we talk about some of the um, evolution that we have recently done in, in the workflows and how data moves between different applications and the data access systems. And later we'll, we'll see the, what's the motivation for building this uh, catalog service. And later again, we, we touch on some of the requirements we started out with and the architecture, some of the workflows as well as APIs, all the good stuff. So, okay, let's start with uh, studio storage and the ecosystem, how it looks like. It may be very similar to some of the things that you build in your own companies uh, in order to address the post-production or the production workflows that you're involved in. Um, at Netflix, we have many applications which work with the studio data or the studio assets. Um, on all of these applications, most of them actually, in fact, run in the AWS cloud. So what sort of applications I'm talking here? So these are asset management. It could be pipelines we build, um, or it could be a metadata service, um, a long-term, a persistent data service. Um, some of them are authentication, authorization services. And these are the common building blocks when you're building software systems. And uh, it's no similar to, um, I mean, it is quite similar to everything that you build in your own companies. So these are the applications we are talking about, and generally they are all running in AWS Cloud. When it comes to data, so media assets. So these media assets are what used in the pros production to build the final content that you see on the Netflix streaming platform. So all this data, while in the post production, they are all stored in AWS S3. This is the persistent storage for the data. So where does all this data come from? I mean, could be many sources, but two of them I'm pointing here is, could be from Netflix Studios, where all this is, uh, is captured on cameras. And Netflix also works with many partner studios. Um, so yeah, on all this data is ingested into the Netflix uh, ecosystem. Um, and like either for visual effects, color correction, or could be sound editing. So many such uh, stages are also handled by many of the Netflix uh, partner studios as well. So this is one of the stages we think of like delivering this data to the partner studios. So in essence, data moves between 
the centralized Netflix uh, studio ecosystem to either studios or Netflix partners. And yeah, you can imagine the workflows. It's kind of iterating between these two uh, endpoints. So, so let's focus mainly on the data processing. As I said, this is how we have been traditionally doing. All the applications are in the cloud and data is in S3 stored as objects. Uh, and we have a identity for all these objects to be addressed by various uh, applications. Along with metadata services, we which capture some of the metadata needed by, uh, by uh, asset management tools or even the, um, the DCC softwares that we use in the post-production. So recently, as I said, we evolved. We evolved mainly in two different aspects. One is to manage the data lifecycle effectively. So we went from um, AWS S3 standard tier to, and we started using the AWS Glacier Flex tier. So this is purely for the data management. Any of the hot data used by these applications will be in the standard tier. And for archival purposes, we started moving data to Glacier tier, which is cost effective as well. So, um, and this in fact changed uh, a bit in our application space in order to track where this data is actually located. When I, when I said applications, these are mainly the data applications, um, not the user visible applications or the user interacting applications. The reason for doing that is we wanted this to be a transparent change for all the higher level applications and need, these applications need not be concerned about where the data is located. Is it an archival tier or is it a frequent access tier? Applications don't care about it. So that's the kind of mindset we started out with. Um, yeah, and it started showing quite a few benefits for us in terms of cost saving. So next. When you look at this, we were all centralized before where the data was stored. So now we kind of decentralized this. Along with AWS regions, we started using AWS local zones. So these local zones are strategically um, used by like even Netflix studios or um, to interact with partner studios, which is like geographically distributed in different parts of the world. And the main reason for doing this is the proximity to the workflows or proximity for the data access. Some of these workflows, as we know, like maybe it could be editing or something else, which needs a really performant, um, which has a really uh, big storage need in terms of performance. Could be latency, could be throughput. So best it is achieved if the data is closer to these workflows or these applications. So for that reason, we started uh, now decentralizing the data. You can see this has like a hub and spoke model, so to speak, where they have a centralized long-term data persistence in AWS S3 with tiers of uh, S3s uh, for uh, archival and for also the control plane, bad jobs, running in the cloud, which wants to use this data in the cloud, all those have access. You can look at the spokes, which are like on the edges, for applications which want to use and high performance. Um, and this is kind of a active data set currently being worked on. Like imagine Stranger Things. It's currently in production or post-production. And many of these uh, assets are being exchanged by different vendors or Netflix studios. And many of the active uh, post-production activities are happening on that. So those sort of things you can imagine being on the edge. So, so this is a kind of a uh, evolution of our architecture in terms of data access. And also one other important thing here is, what we did was, um, the data need not be stored in the same way in all these different regions. That means in the cloud, as I said previously, we are storing it as objects within S3 tier. When it comes to edge, we are in fact storing data in multiple ways. Either it could be object caches, or it could be like a file systems accessed over NFS or SMB. So, and we can leverage any other storage um, flavor, so to speak. We can use um, 
kind of AWS EFS or F FSx or in, in kind of the edge data center of Netflix science could be a third party storage. So we have flexibility to use the appropriate data storage systems that is needed for the application. That was one of the uh, important needs. So now when this data is now decentralized, different formats, different protocols, different storage systems, we, we wanted to now understand how our applications can transparently use this data without needing to change uh, the code or their own behavior based on the underlying storage. So this is how like the ingest and delivery on the applications need not change, but continue to access uh, the data independent of where it is located. And location is another important aspect of it. The data could be, could be anywhere in, in any part of the world in one of these local zones or data, edge data centers. So that was one of the requirements as well. So yeah, this is kind of a, um, the control and management plane, what we decided was, this has to be in the centralized location like AWS. That means it decides where the data is located or how that needs to be accessed, uh, what information is available in what tier of storage or edge, is it a cache, is it a file system. The decision making applications are all located in the cloud. And the transparent data access, I talked about it. We may not touch too much into how the data moves between these locations in the presentations, but I just want to leave you with this information that we do have transfer services which um, makes it possible for applications to access this data wherever they're located. And the transfer services work with the data backend services to mask the underlying specifics of the data storage system. So what do I mean by that? If the data is in terms of files, even the transfer service is agnostic to this fact but the data backend services, when they are handed a unique identity for the data, the backend services understands underlying logic or underlying storage behavior and fetches the appropriate file or the bytes that is needed here. So now with all of this, you see that it is quite important to um, track or even catalog the data wherever the data is located. And that is the need uh, behind building this catalog service. Um, so let me call Priyash on the stage to talk more about how this is being built today. Uh, thanks, Kishore. Um, I hope that gave you a good overview of our uh, overall Netflix studio ecosystem. So one of the things that you would have noticed is that um, we now have objects that are stored across multiple storage systems. These are um, disparate heterogeneous storage systems. And you know, unlike in a homogeneous system where you have internal metadata that tracks where objects reside you know, on what partitions and replicas and so on, we don't have something like that when it comes to uh, dealing with disparate storage systems. And that is the uh, core requirement um, that is a core requirement uh, that necessitated us to build this catalog service so that we, we can have a global registry for all our objects. Now, while, at, while doing this, we also asked ourselves, um, what are the other uh, uh, you know, aspects that this service could basically address? And we realized that um, any attribute or any aspect that, uh, that are associated with objects uh, in general and not with uh, the specifics of uh, where they are physically located, really belonged in this, uh, in this service. Uh, for example, uh, namespace management, uh, you know, objects, regardless of which storage system uh, they are residing in, um, they, belong, they have to belong in a certain namespace. And similarly, um, access management um, is also associated at the object level and not at the storage location level because you either allow access to an object uh, from all storage systems or basically none at all. Um, so that was another thing that we decided we will uh, address with the catalog service. And then we also wanted the catalog service to be flexible enough to address uh, a, a variety of 
storage uh, systems because uh, you know heterogeneity in storage systems uh, come in different flavors. Uh, you could have hot and cold tiers. You could have uh, self-managed storage versus you know storage in the cloud. Um, you could have um, you know object stores and file systems uh, that you have to deal with. And many of these storage systems also um, you know have uh, features that, uh, you know, that might be uh, absent in some other storage systems. For example, uh, some storage systems might support uh, encryption of uh, data, or you know, um, uh, they might uh, allow for uh, checksums to be computed uh, when objects are finalized and so on. So we wanted this service to be able to um, um, you know, accommodate all these features and be able to work with all kinds of storage systems. And finally, uh, you know, Netflix uh, Studio ecosystem, we, we, we've always um, had um, a lot of objects. We, we've been predominantly using S3 over uh, the last several years. So we have an existing uh, corpus of data that we wanted uh, this catalog service to be able to uh, automatically catalog. So these were essentially the main requirements that we started with. And so uh, when designing the catalog service, we basically started by uh, defining the concepts of uh, storage classes and storage locations. And storage classes, as you can see, um, really captures the heterogeneity of storage systems that we've been talking about. So we would have a, a storage class defined for you know, S3 standard, S3 flex. We have had historically uh, use cases of self-managed uh, object caches uh, uh, as well. Um, and we also have had, uh, uh, we also currently have, uh, you know, a use case where um, we store these assets within um, filers, which are mounted uh, onto, um, you know, our uh, application uh, over NFS. So all of these were uh, defined as separate storage classes. And uh, storage locations are basically the, uh, you know, sort of the physical manifestation of these storage classes in that. Uh, you could have multiple instances of, uh, you know, filers that don't know about each other. So we have multiple storage locations of, let's say, the NFS storage class. Um, whereas for something like uh, uh, S3 standard, S3 being a, you know, uh, distributed system, we would have a single location for uh, that storage class. And so this uh, basically, sh uh, you know, uh, provides a simplified overview of the system that we built. So the catalog service uh, consists of uh, two main layers. We have the core layer, uh, the uh, API layer, so to speak, that handles uh, client requests, uh, access control, um, you know, database uh, queries, and so on. And then underlying, uh, you know, uh, below the uh, API layer, we have the storage engine layer which is invoked by the API layer. And as you can see, the storage engine layer is basically where the specifics around dealing with a uh, you know, certain storage class is encapsulated. And we, we designed it in a way where the storage engine layer is you know, abstracted well enough that you know, um, through, through um, well-defined interfaces and functionalities. Uh, and, uh, um, in this example, we, we have two different storage engines uh, uh, that um, you know, addresses S3 as well as uh, NFS. So you can see how uh, the storage engine is dealing with the specifics of the storage that uh, they are basically addressing. The, the main uh, requirements from these storage engines um, are around uh, minting uh, minting URIs basically to be able to upload and download to the respective storage systems. Um, and also, as you can see, um, you know, we, the catalog service, in order for it to be effective, we wanted it to be uh, dynamically be able to um, uh, become aware of changes that happen in the storages, storage systems that it's cataloging. And so the storage engines basically do this work. They basically listen to, um, you know, notifications. In the case of S3 engine, uh, we have uh, an SQS queue set up to listen uh, for events around object finalizations and so on. 
And uh, in the case of uh, the filers, which are mounted over NFS, we actually have our own uh, storage managers that uh, deal with those filers, and we have those storage managers um, send out notifications that are, you know, listen that that the storage NFS storage engines listen to, and update the uh, database. So this is pretty much the way uh, the catalog service works, and also. Um, you know the clients would be interested in um, uh, in, in in the changes that are happening uh, within the catalog service. So we have outgoing notifications set up as well, which the clients of the catalog service can basically listen to. And our data model is fairly uh, simple. We have the concepts of uh, objects, versions, uploads, and parts mainly. So objects are basically the you know the basic entity that we the, the catalog service manages, and um, it's it's associated with a certain namespace or a key space, uh, and 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 a key key name, and uh, um, you know the key name is user generated, um, and as you can imagine, you know you could have multiple versions of the same upload. So um, the catalog service provides first class support for that as well, uh, by um, you know associating versions for these objects. Um, you know, uh, assigning a version UUID for uh, each of these objects. And then objects and versions are generally associated uh, at a higher level, uh, whereas uploads, uh, as you can imagine, is uh, associated with the actual physical, you know, manifestation of a version. So uh, an upload is associated with a certain location, basically. And then, um, you know, we wanted, in order to be flexible, like we um, mentioned earlier, we wanted the catalog service to be able to work with, uh, support multi-part uh, uploads as well, uh, which many storage systems support for, um, you know, um, efficient uh, bandwidth usage or you know, um, retries, better retries on failures and so on. So the catalog service uh, basically provides first-class support for part addressability, um, and so parts are also modeled um, uh, separately. Um, and we, even though we don't have a use case where you know the parts, part boundaries are different across uploads at this time, the catalog service actually supports different part sizes for different uh, uploads um, that of a, of a certain version in different locations. So now let's take a look at the uh, look at an example flow. Um, so. Um, this sort of builds on on the uh, on the earlier uh, diagrams that we saw uh, Kishore present. So this is a slightly simplified view. Um, in this, we have uh, uh, two storage locations: one in AWS, which is Amazon S3, uh, denoted as L0, and we have uh, a filer sitting in a Netflix data center that is mounted over NFS, which is location L1. And the catalog service itself runs in the uh, AWS cloud. So in this example, uh, we have an application that's sitting outside of these data centers and ingesting uh, data into the Netflix data center. This is modeled after one of our uh, existing use cases. So the way it works is the application would uh, first initialize the object that is being ingested within the catalog service. And the catalog service, using the appropriate engine, mints an upload URI that the application then uses uh, to uh, basically send bytes to the uh, uh, NFS storage in the Netflix data center. And in this flow, the access control is all managed within the catalog service so that you know, once the URI is minted, the application can basically write to the uh, NFS storage without further um, authentication or authorization. And once the bytes have been success successfully uploaded, the application would finalize it uh, with the catalog service. And uh, at the end of this operation, we would have something like this in the uh, database. So we would have a, uh, a row created for the object that, uh, that was created and the version that was created. And as you can see, uh, uh, when, a, when a version is uh, initialized by the uh, caller, we allow for providing true checksums that are associated with the version in the sense that this is the uh, checksum that the user knows um, is associated with the version that they are uploading. 
And the idea being, uh, uh, like here we can see that when the upload completes, there is a row created in the uploads table uh, for the uh, version of the object that is associated with that location. And uh, you know the status uh, of that row in the upload table starts uh, with um, in progress state, which is basically when the object is initially in initialized. And then once it gets finalized, um, the status changes to finalized. And then for storage systems that actually support checksum computation, we have uh, support for checksums to be computed and sent to the catalog service. And the catalog service will, in, in the case where the, where the user has provided a true checksum, would compare the checksum that was uh, received for the uh, upload with the true checksum that the user provided and change the state from finalized to either checksum uh, matched or checksum mismatch. Um, so that's the ingest flow. Uh, so here we have, uh, uh, you know, once, once we ingest into the Netflix data center, in this example, we have um, a flow where the object is being transferred from, or you know, we could say backed up from the Netflix data center to S3 in the cloud. And that, that flow looks something like this. So we basically initialize the, uh, the object for the new location. So initialize a new upload for S3. Um, and then um, you know, the application makes a download URI call to the catalog service, uh, providing the previous location. Uh, and the catalog service would mint a download URI for, uh, for the object from uh, location L1, and in the initialized call, it would have returned an upload URI for, the, for location L0. And so now that the application has both an upload URI and a download URI, it would read from uh, uh, location L1 uh, using the download URI and write to um, you know, location uh, L0 using the upload URI. And once that operation is complete, uh, a finalize is called to uh, basically finalize that upload. And at the end of this operation, um, we would not have any new entries in the objects or versions table, as you can imagine, but we would have a new row in the uploads table indicating that this, new, this existing version now has yet another location uh, available for it. So a quick uh, note on the events that we are talking about here. Um, so the different kinds of events of course, I mean, different storage systems um, support different events. But um, the general uh, set of events that most systems support are uh, you know, object finalization related events. Um, some systems support checksum uh, computed events. Some support um, uh, deletion events. And in, in our use case, we, might, we may have um, you know, archival events being sent and so on. Uh, so these are the events that are ingested, and then we have similar events uh, outgoing as well uh, that um, the clients can listen to uh, in order to, you know, um, make changes to their uh, workflows. So the APIs that we support are basically, you know, you can categorize them into uh, essentially three categories. Uh, here are a few examples. So the first set of APIs are lifecycle uh, related APIs. Um, you have initialize, uh, finalize, um, and delete uh, APIs. And some of these APIs are actually bulk APIs as well. Um, and then we have querying related APIs like getting the download URIs or upload URIs and the metadata of these objects. Uh, and then we also have um, admin APIs to add new store locations and um, you know, uh, getting information about new store locations as they come up. Um, if these locations are associated with existing storage classes, then it's a very dynamic operation. But if a new storage class is being introduced, then that means you know, uh, the, we have to implement a, store, a new storage engine uh, um, that, um, you know, that works with that storage class. So a, a, a deeper look at one of these examples, uh, uh, so APIs basically. Uh, so 
uh, here we have an example for the uh, download URI API. And uh, one of the interesting things here is, uh, and these are the kind of things that we sort of can exploit with a catalog service, which is the, the caller can actually provide uh, location filters. Uh, and the location filter is you know, uh, 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 a list of location filters, essentially. And they basically allow the uh, caller to say that you know, we want this object. We want a URI to download this object. But we have a preference for the locations. And typically, um, you could imagine when this is useful. Like if, if the application is sitting um, within the Netflix data center, and you have an upload for that object in both the Netflix data center as well as in, in the cloud, um, it is probably more optimal for that application to get a download URI for the object that is there in the local data center than fetching it from the cloud. So um, the catalog service and, and the application wouldn't have to worry about you know, checking whether these objects are there in these uh, locations, but they could simply provide a, a location, a list of location filters, and the catalog service can use that to um, basically fetch the URI for the most optimal location. Um, and in the response, uh, as we can see, um, you know, depending on the storage location that was used for the uh, URI, um, you know, in the case of S3, we, we might return an S3 signed URL, um, you know, after the client is already authenticated, which means when the, when the client wants to write or read from, uh, or in, the case, in this case, read from S3, uh, they can simply use the S3 signed URL and not have, not, they don't need to uh, do further uh, authentication or authorization. And similarly, in the case of NFS, uh, if we chose the, you know, filers, then we would return an NFS URI. So finally, to uh, summarize, um, uh, to re reiterate uh, the environment, um, you know, the studio, Netflix studio ecosystem has, um, uh, you know, a set of heterogeneous storage systems that it has to work with. And we realized that we would need uh, a service that sits externally to act as the global registry and catalog these objects. And that's why we built uh, a catalog service. Uh, in addition to uh, cataloging these objects, we also uh, you know, um, uh, addressed uh, other attributes or other aspects related to these objects that are uh, associated at a more general level to these objects rather than uh, to their physical presence. Uh, and then the catalog service uh, can be exploited to provide um, you know, location preferences for their APIs. Uh, it allows for part addressability for you know, multi-part uploads. Uh, and some of the um, future work that we have been exploring are you know, better support for lifecycle management, uh, maybe provide an API that uh, lists uh, a set of objects based on some attributes of their uh, objects or policies. Uh, and also build a, a, a smart client um, that sort of uh, hides many of the um, you know, various APIs that the, the client might have to make in order to, let's say, move an object from one location to another. And also because Netflix historically has had a large uh, amount of data that it has stored in S3, and we have uh, used, uh, we have, most of this uh, data is client-side encrypted, and the encryption manage the client side encryption and the encryption key management was done by Netflix itself. So, um, you know, we wanted to implement a smart client that would sort of do these encryptions and decryptions without the client actually having to uh, worry about it. So um, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, let's open it up for Q and A.